All right, guys. Well, look, it's a small group today. It is a small group, but that's all right. Um, so first, <laughs> as Tom says, I'm going to give everybody a heads up. No foul language, not that anybody does. So this meeting is being recorded today. And I didn't realize that when you post something on YouTube, you can't have, it, there's a disclaimer, like no language, no that. Box that you have to check off that says, it, it says they, can kids watch this? Kids, yeah. And if you check the wrong box, you can get banned from YouTube. Yeah. So normally we record the meeting, or I, I say we, I do not do anything. Tom records the meeting at North Point. And yesterday on the Zoom call, which is how it's recorded through, there was a big gray box right in the center. So it's a re-recording of today. Um, so we have it set up and the mic and then, oh, if anybody has any questions, you just have to hold the mic and you have to talk into the mic. So, you know, it's your five minutes of fame, guys. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the burr months and we're going to talk about from seed to harvest and seed to fruit. Um, and I have a little story to share with you about my husband and myself a little bit, but more about my husband. But first, we're going to jump right into you, sir. I'll give you the clicker. You're welcome. Oh, wait. Did you get the microphone? Okay. Oh. Absolutely. So, good morning. Go back up into the water. No, no. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know if you guys heard. Uh, NAR settlement. There's uh, this thing that happened. Um, but uh, I want to talk about some of the myths that are out there when it comes to uh, the settlement and pertaining to mortgage. So um, the first one, the uh, NAR settlement will change access to mortgages. Um, that's not true. Buyers access to mortgages remains unchanged. Um, you know, and just like before, for the settlement, uh, the choice of who pays commissions, you know, seller, buyer, listing broker, uh, that still persists. Nothing has changed with that, um, you know, as far as uh, mortgages and, and things like that. Um, when it comes to, it's really tricky to click through. Do you want me to click through for you? No. Okay. It'll be all right. Um, real estate commissions can be financed. Uh, there was actually a situation that popped up last week where a lender was saying that a uh, buyer could roll in uh, commissions into the loan. Uh, that is not allowed. Uh, we can't finance the commissions uh, to pay to you guys as buyer agents. Uh, Fannie and Freddie have rules against this, um, including commission. You know That increases the loan amount and that potentially impacts eligibility. So we just can't do that. We have to uh, be mindful of that. And if you see that, you know, you want to question it um, because it's it's a no no. Uh, myth number three: There's a cap on how much the buyer can pay in commission based on the loan type. Uh, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, and VA will not count buyer agent commissions as an interested party contribution. So going towards like seller assist. Um, you know, buyer agent commissions are not subject to any financing concession limits. You know, that's something that's going to be paid out of pocket, you know, up to you guys, you know, to what you guys are, are, um, you know, worth and what you're supposed to get commission wise. But uh, there isn't a cap to to the buyer with any of the agencies. So get your full clip. And then uh, myth number four. The buyer has to get pre-approved before or after signing a buyer broker agreement. Um, obviously, the timing of pre-approvals happen. You know, you don't want to go out and show people homes. You know, champagne dreams on a beer budget. Um, you know, buyers can get pre-approved before or after signing that signing that broker agreement. Uh, but it's crucial for loan officers to know if the buyer plans to pay any of the buyer com agent commission. Um, you know, why is this important? You know, sometimes with loans, when we're running through the automated underwriting system, there's a need for reserves in their bank account. Um, if they're, you know, going to be cutting you a check for 5000 10000 whatever, that can cut into that and they could go from being 
eligible at that price point to no longer being eligible. Um, you know, so it, it really affects the, uh, potentially affects the loan qualification. Um, you know, we may have to adjust the terms of the loan to, uh, to make it work with the commissions. So it's very, very important to let your loan officer know if the buyer will be paying any of the commissions so we can make sure it works. We can add that in, um, you know, when we're running it through the automated underwriting system, just to ensure that, uh, you know, it works, you know, we have accuracy with our findings. Um, really just, we want to avoid any potential issues. We don't want to go under agreement. And then it's like, Hey, by the way, they're paying X amount of money in commissions. And all of a sudden it doesn't work because a, they don't have enough money to pay your commission or, um, we're no longer getting an approval. So ultimately open communication is the biggest thing with that. Um, you know, so just check in, you know, I, I update my, uh, for all of my buyers, you know, when I get updated bank statements and things like that, I'm updating the the assets in the loan file. So I know how much they have and, and I can let you know if, uh, you know, ultimately they're able to pay, um, how much they're able to pay and if it'll still work. So just communicate, make it a smooth transaction. Any questions? All right. That is all I have. You're next. Thank you. And I was going to say, you can skip right to, yep, okay, buyers. Bye. Make sure I have the right one. So um, whether you're the listing agent or the buyer's agent, you always get a document from home sale, you know, asking you certain questions. So in an effort to make sure that we are doing things correctly as far as commissions, if the buyers are paying them, because we don't see a lot of those other documents that you have, um, the agency contracts. So on our form at the very top, we have some questions and I just want to run over them. So, you know, if you get this, how they're actually supposed to be answered because they can be confusing. I do know that they're going to be adding where you can find the answer, like, like buyer agency contract or, you know, whatever. So um, they will be adding that. But on the buyer, if you have the buyer, they're asking you um, that the total that you are receiving as the buyer's agent, whether it's from the buyer or the seller. So if you're receiving 3%, you're getting 2.5 from the seller and 0.5 from your buyer. That would be 3%. You're getting 3% commission. Then um, on the next one, they want to know how much. This is the old one. Oh, what portion of the All right. This one, they want to know how much is the listing agent paying you. Um, so if that's the whole 3% or if it's 2.5, that's where you'll put that. Then the, I want to make sure that this matches up compensation to the buyer's broker. What portion of the broker? See, they changed this. Yeah, they changed. They changed. Yeah, they changed this around a little. So uh, th they must still have the old thing in these slides. Um, now, where it says what portion of the buyer broker commission fee is being paid by the seller, um, they're asking if they're paying like above and beyond, which would never really happen. So I don't even know why that one's on there, but they want it on there um, in, in case they would be paying extra. Now, what amount, if any, is being paid by the seller towards the closing cost? That's just seller assist. They're just asking if there's any seller's assist on that. And then they're asking if you have um, a broker fee. So that's that. And again, this is a little different. That has A has through, like two, yeah, two that has, <laughs> yeah, they have too many lines on there. And yeah, so that's not even co correct anymore. They changed it. We just went over it in a meeting um, the other day. But if you get one and have any questions, just ask me because I know they're just trying to make it 
so that we are sure we have the correct information to put on there because we don't want to miss if a buyer is supposed to be paying part of the commission. Because there, you know, was an instance in the past where that happened. The listing agent didn't catch it until after settlement and the buyer's agent saw the CD, but they didn't catch it. It wasn't one of ours, but um, we really want to try to avoid that. And then the next one is for the, if you're the listing agent. So again, they want to know the total um, broker fee. That would be like, if it was 6%, you're the listing agent, 6%, 6% whatever the total is, or 5.5 or whatever it's going to be. And then they want to know what you're paying the cooperating broker. So then how much is going to the buyer's agent? Um, again, what portion of the buyer's broker commission is being paid by the seller? That's, again, uh, never really going to use that. Um, that's just something that's like above and beyond. And then again, um, if the seller's paying any closing costs, you would put that in E, and then again, your broker fee in F. So it's basically the same thing that we've always been asking you. They just really tried to break it down because they really want to make sure that we know what the buyers are paying. So if you have any questions when you get one of these, just let me know. Um, as long as I know how much the seller's paying you, how much the buyer's paying you for the CDs, that's the important thing. Okay. Any questions? All right. At the end of the day, yes. Yes. That is that is complicated. Very wordy. And this is the third, fourth meeting that we're doing, and it's the overwhelming. This is complicated. Yes. Exactly. And so it is designed by attorneys um, to protect. We need to know what's being paid and who it's being paid by. Two simple things. Right. And we need to really be on top of that as we move forward in this, as you guys have been, because it's a top of mind. You're filling out the CBC, you're filling out the agreement of sale. So you just want to make sure that all you're doing is passing that information along to title so that they know. Right. And one other thing I wanted to add, it's just very important that you check your CDs when you get them. Check and make sure that the commissions are on there because... There's still humans involved, and you know we just want to make sure that it's done correctly before seven. Okay, this is going to be short and sweet because everybody's sick of hearing about roofs, but <laughs> they are cracking down. This is a good piece that you can pass out to your new buyers or past clients and that type of thing. Any questions? <laughs> <Very> <laughs> All right. Whoops. The back off here. Whoops. So uh, October 15th, 10 to 11 is the next town hall with Rod. Just make sure you put it on your calendar so that you can tune in for that. It feels like we just had the, the last one. And now here we are talking about the next one. So, you know, tell me time flies without telling me time, time flies. Uh, the DEI committee. So at Home Sale, we have a group. It's the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. A lot of great things have come of this, um, things that we have implemented as a company already, but they're always looking for input and feedback from other agents. So if you are interested in being a part of this committee, you can reach out to Sue Kitchman. She's in our Harrisburg area. Um, I believe that they meet via Zoom. So it's not like you would have to travel, but this is a great opportunity to connect with other agents throughout the company or, and, and give your input and be a part of something. So you can reach out to Sue or you can let Tom and I know and we'll connect you with the, with the right people. So yesterday, just curious, did anybody tune into this and watch this, the expert panel? What did you think? It's good. A lot of different ideas. I, I thought so too. Um, Tom and I watched it together and we thought that there was a lot of, it, it was, so Allison is out of our North Point office, Allison and Rod. And then we had Vince Lisi, who's um, the CEO in Omaha, Nebraska. And then um, Ann King, who was out of the Florida office. And then the two other agents, Kobe, which was with Vince and Shonda. 
Kobe was amazing. He dropped a lot of great information. It was recorded. So if you did not get a chance to watch it, yep, go back and watch it. It was an hour, 55 minutes-ish. Um, it moved pretty quick. They did talk a lot about the Zillow showcase and how it, they're finding that it is benefiting their properties. Um, but they also talked about like a listing launch and how they list their launchings and or launch their listings and um, some different marketing pieces. So again, I would go back once that's sent out. Jen Jones did, did say at the end that it would be recorded. It was being recorded. Last year, I don't know if you guys remember, we had someone come in and talk about the 1031 Corp for the 1031 exchange. Um, I thought that was a fantastic session when she came in and did that last year. So you can look at this as either a refresher or if you were not able to be here for that, an introduction. At the end of the day, you're probably not going to do too many that are through a 1031 exchange, but you will have in real estate at least one throughout your career this is just an opportunity to kind of learn about it hear some different things um, have some talking points that you can take back when your buyers say yep i'm interested in purchasing a property but i'm purchasing it through a 1031 exchange uh, really there's not a lot that you have to do if it's a 1031 exchange it's it's pretty much a traditional sale except how they're pulling their proceeds and the time frame that they have to do it in. So again, another one that we encourage you to tune in for, it is on Thursday, October 3rd. Um, and when we send out the links, they will be hyperlinks that you can click on and you can register. Agent services workshop. So on, there's two that will be close to here, September 17th and September 19th. This is make an appointment with an agent services representative that you can go in and have one-on-one -on -one with, hey, here's what I'm looking to do. Can you help me get there? And so we did this a couple years ago in different offices where we had an agent services rep come in and sit and agents would make appointments and say, hey, I'm looking at changing up my website or I'm looking at getting on a drip campaign, or can you help me with, you know, creating a video, not creating the video, but editing and putting a video together to post out on social media. This is an opportunity. We have this great department that do all these things, but a lot of times when you send an email, you can't clearly tell them what you want to do. But if you're sitting down with them and it's just one-on-one, -on -one, you can be like, okay, well, what about this? Well, how can I do this? Uh, maybe it's designing a postcard campaign and how does that look? These are the streets that I would like, or this is how I would like that to look, or this is what I want. Take advantage of this. Um, I have sat down. Dawn is amazing. Jen Hummer, all of them are, are absolutely amazing, but it's an opportunity. Now you do have to register for a time if you'd like that one-on-one -on -one. and correct me if I'm wrong, but there will be kind of a little overview at one point of, hey, here are some of the things that we do. And then they'll be there for the rest of the day with the one-on-ones. So if you can't make it and you just want to pop in for 20 or 30 minutes, take advantage and, and sign up for that. Video scripts. This kind of goes along with the previous. We talked last month about the changes, the video changes for the NAR. We showed a video of an example of what that would look like. Use the script. You can use the script yourself record it and post it. You can use the script and you could take advantage of having it personalized to you at the end, or you could use the script, record it, and have them create an engaging video with some B-roll and you talking over the B-roll. Regardless of which direction you go, using these scripts that are out there are absolutely kind of a no-brainer only because they're free and they're out there and it's just a way. And I get it, video may not be for you, but there are also ways if you don't wanna be on the screen to have where there's a green screen, there's, there's a picture of this wall or these three amazing people sitting here and all you hear is me talking while you have this as a picture. So if you don't wanna be the focal point of it, you can talk over it. And maybe it's a video that is scrolling through some different houses or some different testimonials that you have. These would be great things to talk about at the agent services sit down on how to put that together. But if you are comfortable being on screen, on camera, 
use these. There's a click, there's a link for the library that you can take advantage of where we have all of the scripts in there. They are in Jen's email every Monday, the scripts. All right, September is Realtor Safety Month. Um, we do have, just hand out four of them. <laughs> so September is Realty Safety Month. We, there is a through NAR, there is a live webinar on the 18th next week at one, just that have some tips for you as far as staying safe. Um, I've given this example a couple of times at sales meetings in my career selling real estate. I've had a few times where I did not feel safe. And the first time I had not told anybody where I was going because, well, that could never happen to me. And so I went out on a showing. Um, my buyer did not get there on time. And so I was stuck in a house where they would not let me leave. It was a very uncomfortable situation. The, they had a special needs child that had my car keys, um, which I, it was, a, you know, you're thinking, okay, they're playing with the keys. It's occupying. Don't think any, but I felt so uncomfortable that I thought in my mind, I have no out because I don't have my keys. I'm not even sure what happened to, you know, this child where he went. Um, they refused to turn the lights on in some of the rooms that they were showing to me before my buyer had gotten there. Um, there were people everywhere, people living out of one room. I was, I was panicked and I thought to myself, no one knows where I am other than my buyer who I had never met. And here I am in this situation. <clears throat> Thankfully, my buyer did get there about 20 minutes late. And I was able to say, I'm going to go outside and greet my buyer. And my buyer was a, a little, a little rough, um, and said to me, oh, we're good. We're good. Let's go in and look at this house. And I was like, okay, well, you say we're good. We're going to go back in and look at this house. I never from that point on ever went to a property without A, telling someone where I was going and B, making sure that I had either met someone before or taking someone with me. Um, so that could have, I'm sure it was nothing, but I was very uncomfortable and it scarred me so that the next time I had to go in a situation where I was very, I took someone with me who carries a little friend with them. Um, and I said, hey, would you go with me on this listing appointment? And sure enough, it was another very scary, very scary situation. Matter of fact, when they went to walk us around the property, they when, they, when we got there, the person was in a snowsuit in their house. And I thought this is awkward, but I'm good because I've got this person here who has a, and I we walk in and what is that smell? They had a leak. Like it was, it was such an awkward situation. And there were very rough, mean dogs that were on the porch that we, if we wanted to get out, we would have gone through these dogs. And she said, as, as we're going to go through this, just to keep them back and probably feed them and, and gave them three big plates of raw meat. Like on the, and I thought I'm trapped in this house. I am trapped, but I'm not by myself. We go outside to walk the property and she grabs a bright orange hat and puts it on her head. And I was like, Oh, and she was like, you never know around here. She was like, if you don't have a, a thing on, they might shoot you. And I'm thinking, Oh, oh my word. So anyway, point is, this is a great opportunity to learn some safety tricks. <laughs> I kind of talked to like, Tracy at Elkar one time. Oh, sorry. oh, that's right. <laughs> I had talked to Tracy at Elkar one time about the forewarn app, and I know they were looking into that mm -hmm. to maybe see if they could offer it, you know, at a group rate. Has anybody heard any update on that? Um, I think I believe they're bringing it. it. They're bringing it to Elkar. It is a good app. Yeah. Yeah. Um... As you know, the NAR thing hit, and uh, they've been focusing a lot on that. They had planned to bring that to the Elkar general population before the end of the year. I'm not 100% sure that's going to happen, but I know it's in discussion. Everybody was on board with it. So I believe it is going to be a feature, if not by the end of the year, probably into 2025. All right, so Agent Plus, this is just a reminder um, that Agent Plus is a great, again, I'll just hand out four of them. 
Agent Plus is a great uh, opportunity for you to put us in front of agents, whether they're agents that you've worked with that you feel very strongly, <laughs> great work ethic would meet our culture, or also agents that are not licensed who might be a great fit. Um, we are always looking to grow our team, but we're only looking to grow our team with people that are going to complement us, not just to fill desks, not just to. So who better to come to than you guys who are out there day in and day out dealing with people. And I know that I have heard from some that these are ones that I never want to have to work with again. Well, sometimes that's good for us to also hear and know because we're not out there. So we, we don't know. Um, but if you come across any, <laughs> if you come across some that you're like, the, this would be a great fit, please let us know. And it's also a way for you to earn income, residual income for the life of them being with the company and also with you that doesn't affect their take home. So it comes off of the company dollar side. And referrals. So referrals are another great way to build your business for income on the side. Um, you don't have to do much, you know. You can literally submit it through and they'll connect you with another real estate agent. Or if you have an agent that you'd like to work with, whether it's within the Berkshire Hathaway network or not, still, you can submit it through our referral department and they will track it for you. I know for me, if I am placing a referral the way that I've always done it and still will do it is, hey, I'm gonna pick three agents in an area and I'm gonna interview those three agents over the phone so that I can present three options to my buyers who are looking to move to that area and say, hey, I've spoken to these three, I want to give you the option. I've always looked at it rather than say, here, I've picked an agent for you and then it doesn't work out or it's not a good fit for them. I can present them with three, two or three, and then they can make a decision and go with who's the best fit for them. Once I do that, then you submit it through the reload department and they track it so you don't have to do anything. You do the work up front. If you don't interview them ahead of time and you're just connecting, hey, Lauren, She's from Dallas, Texas. She does a great job. I'm going to connect you with them. You submit it through Reload. Now, Lauren doesn't have to keep tracking. Okay, where are we at on this? Where are we at on the deal? What's happening? Did it settle? Did it not? The, the Reload company will do that for you. Okay? So make sure, regardless if you're going through Reload to connect them, you still submit the referral through Reload so that they can keep track of it and they can take care of the legwork for you guys. All right, uh, office pop by party. So we have coming soon on there something that we as a company are introducing. So for Buffini people who have ever done Popeyes from Buffini, where you have the little tags, you put them together and you drop them off. We are creating our own version of that. Agent Services is working on that. Um, it we're thinking probably in October. What the plan will be is. We'll get a time together where we're going to come together in the office and put them. We'll either have pizza or sandwiches for lunch, put some Popeyes together. Um, agent services are going to create the tag and they're going to order the stuff for us. What you have to do is let them know or us, which we're still a little unclear on what that'll look like, how many you want. And then they'll bill it to your agent account. So let's say they're going to, you know, you're going to give out cups that say, I'm here to keep your real estate knowledge full. They create the tag, they'll order the cups, they will all be delivered here to the office, we would put them together and then off you go to deliver them. Um, you would be billed for the price of the cup or whatever it is, if it's a pack of gum, if it's windshield washer, whatever it is, um, but we'll put them together and then off you go. It takes, it's kind of like the video scripts, it takes the guesswork out of it, it takes the legwork out of having to go get them, so there's no reason that we can't get them done because it's right here in front. All you have to do is push a button and show up. So stay tuned on that date. All right, so some home value, home value, equity, and debt. This is, Tom has put together the next couple, Tom put together all of the slides, um, but the next couple slides, I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth with Tom. Do you have the microphone back? Okay. <laughs> um, on some charts that were pulled up. So there was a lot, of, there is a lot of, 
we're headed back to a, you know, a housing crash or we're, we're headed here and this is where, and they're relating it back to, okay, well in 2008, 2009, if you look up here, you can see the home values where they are, the equity where it is and the debt. And you can see that the equity and the debt kind of, that's, that's how we ended up where we were. Well, you look at where we are today, even if prices drop a little bit, the debt is way down and the equity and the values are way up. So when you look at a chart like this, it's very hard to say, oh yeah, we are headed back to where we were in 2008, 2009, 2010, just because of where we fall. Do you wanna add anything onto that? Yeah, um, Letha, you're probably in the business long. Did you ever do short sales at all? Yeah, they're not fun. They are not fun. Um, so a short sale, and I don't want to assume everybody knows what a short sale is. A short sale is you can sell your house for this, but the amount you owe is this, which means you are short to pay back the mortgage. What uh, this reflects is you see values, they started going down. The debt was fairly stable. And it's still fairly stable, if even if you look uh, at today in 2024. But look at the difference between the home value, which is the blue line, and the debt line, which is the red line. It is substantial. So even if we take a big hit regarding home values, we are still a long way away from where we were in 2007 to 2012, 2013. Um, but I hear a lot of things in the press, in the media saying the home prices are not sustainable. It's getting too expensive for everybody. And sooner or later, it's going to crash and we're going to be right back to where 2007, 2000 ain't going to happen. Not that they won't go down a little bit, but it's not going to be like it was back when Letha and I were pulling our hair out. <laughs> so. All right. And then. Now, how is the Lancaster County real estate market faring in relation to other parts of the state or the country? So Bright has, through T3 Home Demand Index, there is, and I discovered this two weeks ago when Tom showed it to me, I had never messed around with it, but on Bright, if you go to the market and then you click on Home Demand Index, it will give you these amazing facts on what is happening out there and great tools that you can use as you're meeting with sellers and you're talking to them about house pricing and what's happening in the market. So what we're gonna show you is, it is usually when you see charts, it's based on sold. You know, here's what has sold, here's where we're at, here's where, this is moving from listing forward, pre-sale, clicks, views, and what's happening in the market as far as, okay, in this area, there's five houses for sale and they're getting, you know, 30 clicks a, a house or they're getting views versus this area over here is not getting as many. This will show you in, and Tom, jump in anytime you want. If I'm, this will show you the surrounding counties, Berks, Schuylkill, Lebanon, based on the amount of traffic that's happening as far as, this T3 index from right. If you look, they're all right around the 100. Okay, this is what's happening. Here is Lancaster County. So we are still in a market where people are actively looking. They're viewing the properties that are out there. They are clicking on them, we're getting. Now, we don't have it up here, but if you go into Bright and you go to market and you click on this, you can actually pull up and see zip codes. And the zip codes will show you, okay, they'll be in different colors. Well, once you click on the zip code, it'll give you the information for what is happening in that particular zip code. So if you're going to meet with someone and they're saying, well, you know, I heard that the market's really, really hot and you know that the clicks and the views are down, you can pull up some factual data in front of them and show them. Versus if it's an area that is, okay, yeah, it's still happening. There's a lot of clicks. There's a lot of views. There's showings. It's based off of, you know, those three things. Maybe you have a better chance of 
yep, the market is still hot. So we can go in and we can price this aggressively or we can price this accordingly. I want to add. Yeah. Um, the reason why I like this versus looking at looking backwards, as Colleen said, most of the stuff that we get is factual data. Like, you know, what what's sold? But that data, if you think about it, is like 60 to 90 days old. It's not current. Um, and markets change fast. And as you see this chart right here, when you, I think we've all heard over time, all real estate is local. Boy, if that doesn't tell you that all real estate is local, nothing will. Uh, the other thing Colleen said, you can take this one step further. You can get the entire map of Lancaster County and you can see the zip codes that are hot, that have high uh, home demand indexes, and you can see the zip codes that aren't as hot. So how this helps you is if you're going out to take a listing in an area that's very, very hot, uh, which means a lot of people are looking at, a lot of people are clicking on listings, you can probably fudge the price a little bit. Um, but if you're in an area where it's really low, 50, 45, man, I would think twice about taking a listing that is not listed properly and correctly at the right price because you're dealing with an area that isn't quite as hot as other areas. And you will be amazed if you look at Lancaster County, and by the way, they, everything's color-coded, so it's really easy to follow, um, you will see the really hot areas in Lancaster County and the areas that aren't so hot. And you can do this for every, virtually every county that is in the bright MLS footprint. So even if you go over to York County, I know Lauren's from York, you can do the same thing here. Um, you can pull up the entire county of York and see which zip codes are hot and which ones aren't as, as uh, prevalent. So it's a great tool. And I would encourage you before you go to a listing, regardless, pull this up and check it out because it at least just gives you another talking point when you go if, and if nothing else, it gives you that knowledge in the back of your head. So you're like, okay, I know this is a really hot area um, and do it along with your CMA. Wait, the microphone. <laughs> this is getting a little bit more granular, but I still have some sellers who do not want to list first. And I would love if there was some data that I could show them, you know, the small number of sale and settlement contingencies that are getting accepted. Is that recorded anywhere? I don't think that that is. And I don't know that you would be able to do that. I mean, maybe on a inner office, but even so, I don't. Well, what are you guys seeing? I mean, you I would think you guys maybe hear a little bit about that because from my perspective, I'm thinking that's still like, that is such a slim chance, but I didn't know how it's right. always been a slim chance. Yeah, always. yeah. It's just some things people you did, and they're so scared because the inventory is so low, but I feel like you're not going to get anywhere in the state. Um, I will that. tell you that probably within the last four to five weeks, I have heard of more being accepted than the previous four to five months or years, years yeah. um, only because, but again, it goes back to strong offer and having that conversation with the seller who is also the buyer of, we need to be very strategic on our pricing because when we write our offer, they're going to pull up the house. They're going to see what the house is. They're going to want to know what you're listing it at or below. And so having that key piece of being, hey, using exactly this of going in and saying, Mr. Seller, you're ha like, this is in an area where it's not getting as many clicks, as many views. Um, so we need to be aggressive if we need to have a chance. I think that we're going to start to see more of that. That's my personal opinion. Um, but I still think that because of the low inventory in the Lancaster County area, that there are a lot of buyers out there who do not have that. And so if, if Mr. Seller slash buyer, you want to have a chance, you really are going to be in a better position. If you put your house up for sale, make it contingent upon you finding something and then making an offer because having someone accept a settlement contingency is a heck of a lot easier and it's still a challenge, but it's a heck of a lot easier than having to say, we'll have it up for sale within three or four days, and then we'll get a buyer. 
which may or may not have a home sale contingency. Do you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, we do not live in a vacuum. Uh, now, what I mean by that is everybody today is they're afraid they can't find something because their home is going to sell really fast. Okay. So let's go out into the future, two years, if it takes that long to build the inventory, go out in the, in the market two years. And now there's a plethora of homes out there to select from. Now people feel good about it, but guess what? You're now in a situation where you have to sell your home with a whole bunch of homes that are competing with it. So you're, you're not competing in a vacuum. Uh, you can't have it both ways. I will tell you a personal story. I'm in my fifth home. I have never put a house for sale contingency on any of the houses that I purchased. Every single one I sold first, moved into an apartment for two or three months or six months, and then moved to my second home. I want to have the cash in my back pocket, hard to believe. I want to have the cash in my back pocket before I then went out to, and that way there's no pressure. I know you hear people say, oh, I don't want to move two times. Great. Sit tight here for another year and a half. Yeah. Okay. I completely agree. I just wondered if there was any don't data to show them to get them off the fence. Yeah, I'm not sure we can, you, you can probably find it if you pull up every individual listing and see if there's a contingency thing in there and bright MLS, but that's really, really time consuming. And as I said, I constantly talk to people, you do not live in a vacuum. If we're in a tight market right now, you're in a tight market. If there's a lot of inventory, you're going to be competing against a lot of them. Um, so. Pick your poison. All right. And so lastly, the 2024 home price forecasts. So this is an average 3.1 appreciation depreciation for 2024 as of August. Um, and you'll see, you know, it's, it's a variety of different predictions across there for nationwide. Here is where the Lancaster County is at as of August. Again, Lancaster County is its own bubble. Um, you know, we even yesterday on the call, I don't know if you picked up on this, Emily, but one of the first, within the first 10 or 15 minutes, they were talking about, you know, when a house sits on the market for 60 days, maybe you go back and do this. And Rod and Allison both said, well, we are not in a market like that yet. Um, we're sure it's coming, but we aren't having those houses that are priced correctly. They are desirable sitting on the market for 60 days. We're still seeing multiple offers. We're still seeing over, you know, over list. We had one the other day, over a hundred thousand dollars over the list price. Haven't seen one like that in a while. Um, but another one, 50,000 over the list price with multiple offers. So we are very, bubble um, in the appreciation as of August of 10.9 compared to the national average of 3.1. All right. So the fruits of your labor. So someone asked me after I went through this, oh, did you take these pictures along the way with the intention of using it for a sales meeting? And my answer is no. I didn't take any of these pictures except for one. Um, but when I was thinking about everything that my husband went through with, with his peppers. Um, it was a perfect example of how to nurture. So for the past however long, months, if not two years, we've been looking at how do we get a how do we get an offer accepted? How do we write an offer that we can have it? For the past couple months, it's how do we understand this form? What form do you use for this? What we've been so focused on forms and competing offers and just the the just in general you know house prices and it, that the one thing that seems to be pushed to the back burner in a lot of cases is the relationship the relationship with the client especially for the, since probably what April or May as we've been talking about this form and that form and this commission and that commission and how you do this and how you word that and this script that dialogue if you don't have the client relationship, the forms, the scripts, the dialogues, the pricing, none of it matters. And so I said to myself, after we did the last sales meeting, 
I'm not doing it. I will talk about new forms if I have to introduce them, but it is time to talk about selling real estate. It is time to move forward and say, here's where we are. We're not going backwards. The forms are not going to change. Let me take that back. The forms <laughs> will change. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. But we're not going back to what they were. And so we have a choice. We can complain about how the forms and what you have to do and this and that and all the hoops you have to jump through. Or you can say, it is what it is. This is what I love to do. This is what I'm going to do. And now I'm going to focus on building my business. And I'm going to focus on the heart of my business. And what is that? The relationship. So I thought, that's what I'm talking about. Now, how can I go through? Well, I've watched my husband over the course of the summer do something that for all purposes, he really didn't, I didn't set him up well for success, but he still overcame it. So this is the fruit, this little vial on the end here is the fruit of my husband's labor. This, on the other hand, is the fruit of my labor. Those are my beautiful tomato plants. As you can see, they're amazing. They're so great, guys. <laughs> Yesterday at the North Point meeting, Donna Giovingo came in, and when she came in, she handed me a, a, a jam-packed bag of tomatoes. And she sat in there, and I thought, oh, my gosh, this is so perfect. It wasn't intended. I have to get my tomatoes from someone else because this is my <laughs> tomato plants. <laughs> But what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take you through the process of his peppers and give you examples of how it relates back to real estate. So this is not a lesson on how to grow peppers. It is a relationship on nurturing relationships. But first, I want to talk about the burr months. So the burr months, September, October, November, December. I love summer. I love all seasons, but I love summer. I am the one I'm hanging on. The pool is not closed. I'm like, it's a heated pool. Why would I close it? It's still... I'm holding on, I'm holding on. My husband said to me, I'm stopping at the pool place. And I said, for what? Thinking, oh my gosh, is he getting the stuff to close? And he's like, they're just having a sale and it only goes till, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I hang on, but I love the burr months. I think there's something so special about them where the leaves change, it's beautiful. Um, it's the cozy time. It's also the best time to re-engage with your clients. And I've been giving the example, if you show up with a pie to your client in March or April and say, here, I have this pie for you. Thank you so much. They're going to be grateful and they're going to appreciate it. But it's a little like, okay, well, what's the occasion? Why are you showing up? If you show up with a pie in October or November and say, here you go, I'm so grateful for you. It just, it flows a heck of a lot smoother and they don't feel like it's more salesy. It's more, hey, it's that time of the year. So it's a perfect time to be enthusiastic and refocus and refocus on the client relationship. We need to approach the end of the year and we're lining up for 2025. So what we do today from here on out is going to line up what happens the end of the year and then starting in 2025. I was the agent who worked every month except for June, July, August, and December. I When I sold real estate, those are the months I'm not. And I always paid the price because I was busy in the beginning of the summer, then it leveled off, then the kids went back to school and I had nothing, so I had to gear back up. Well, then December came and it was the Christmas season and I love the Christmas season and who works in December? Everybody but me. Uh, so my January and February were slower. So we want to nurture our business from seed to harvest. So here's here are the pepper plants. My husband, his name is Eric and his cousin is Andy. They love hot peppers. Um, Andy has grown them in the past, and this year he decided he was going to give some plants to my husband. So every picture is taken either by Andy or Eric or the one by me. This is when Andy first planted them in the pods, so put the seeds in the pods. So planting the seed, our initial contact. When you plant the seed with your potential future client. It's when you first meet them, whether that's at an open house, from a referral, a sign call, a duty call. That is that is planting the seed. That is the very first interaction that you have with your future client. It is something that you have to show the genuine interest. You have to be involved. It's not if they call you from the sign and say, hey, I'm interested in one, two, three, Main Street. Oh, it's sold. No, it's you know what, let me pull that up for you. Let, what questions can I ask? Even if you know that it's already sold, 
if you know it's already under contract, you know what, here are the details of that house, but it is actually under contract. But let me tell you this, I can put a search out, I can do this. You are establishing and you are showing that you are genuinely interested in helping them. Just as when you first plant them, if you just took a seed and you dropped it in the dirt outside, chances are it's not gonna be as successful as putting it in the little pods and starting it inside before you put it out there in, in the weather. Watering the seed, building trust. Once the seed is planted, it needs consistent watering to grow. You have to build trust with your client by consistent communication and follow-up. If they never hear from you again, you're not watering that seed. It's not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna die before it even gets started. You have to give them valuable information. Answer their questions and show that you're there. You're going to be attentive to their needs. It's like watering the seed, ensuring that it has what it needs to sprout. So Andy took this picture. It's when it first, and this has been an ongoing thing between the two of them texting. Andy lives above Lebanon. Eric, we live down in Quarryville. And so since they couldn't be back and forth at each other's houses, Andy's like, look, dude, they're, it's starting. I'm going to be bringing them to you. So this is on Andy's windowsill. Providing the sunlight, demonstrating your expertise. The sunlight is essential for your seed to grow. Just like our expertise and nurturing is essential for our real estate relationships or our relationships in general to grow and to mature. So you think about it, when you plant a plant, I, I am not good with plants either. I probably should ask Letha because I know she, when you put a plant in the window, the plant will grow towards the sunlight, which I never understood why one side of the plant was always so great. And they're like, well, you need to rotate it, Colleen. <laughs> the same thing in our yard. When I look at the trees and I think, what? I just wish what? It's because they grow towards the sunlight. Well, your relationships with your clients, they're going to grow towards you. The more you give them, the more they're going to come towards you. If someone else is watering them from the other side, then they're gonna gravitate. It's just gonna be a matter of where they're getting it from, making sure that you are being aware. Give them guidance, give them advice. So this is when the plants come to us. So a little, a little backstory on this. This, Andy shows up at our house the end of May, beginning of June, and he's got these three plants for Eric. And he says, okay, he, they call they dude they call it their cousins dude hey dude you got a pot for it and eric was like colleen do you have a pot for me now something about me is i like everything pretty i like everything in its place you could walk into my house now and i could host a dinner party and you would never it's not like oh i gotta go home and clean up before i have i'm just i'm one of those people so out by our pool, our pool is set up. We have a couch and two chairs with an umbrella. It's all set up and it's it's set up to the way I like it. These pepper plants were not part of my decor, okay? I planted all of my flower pots for the first time this year. I had beautiful flowers. I had a color scheme. And then Eric's like, okay, do we have a pot? And I'm like, I mean, where are you going to put them? And he's like, well, where do you think? So this spot here is behind the couch so that you couldn't really see it. It's blocked from the road so people walking by couldn't see it because there's a rose bush on the other side. And it's right up against the house. The worst spot in the yard to plant pepper plants and expect them to grow. But they weren't mine, so it was like, okay. And again, that's terrible. <laughs> it's horrible, but it's the truth. So this pot here, that's, that's the tomato plant. Now that was out. We had that kind of strategically placed because it was tomatoes for everybody. No one else in our family eats hot peppers. So here's Eric in this little time. And his cousin says, dude, do you need me to get you, buy you a, another pot? You know, I can order one and send it to you. And he's like, no, it, you know, and I, I, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. He's like, I don't know if they're going to take off. It's like such a small pot for three of these. We're like, it's okay, it's gonna be fine. So overcoming the obstacles. First and foremost, I gave Eric the worst obstacle and that was the location and the pot size, all right? When you have um, things like weeds, you gotta pull the weeds. When you're working with a client, you're going to have situations. Hence, 
what's going on in the market right now, you know? Okay, we're gonna have to overcome this where we aren't quite sure what the commission's gonna be. Or how do we overcome the weed of, you need to sell your house before you can buy. You are the voice of reason. You are the one that needs to guide them and show them you can trust me because I've done this before. I know what I'm doing and you can rely on me. You need to be the one that's nurturing and taking care of addressing the weeds with them. By managing these challenges, you're clearing the path, path for a stronger relationship because they're going to trust you. So we, yep, speed of trust. So nurturing the growth, providing ongoing support. So this is the one picture that I took. This is my husband. Um, so I'm in my house. I'm standing at my kitchen island and I'm making dinner. And I look out and there he is taking a picture of this plant. Now, you should know about my family. We love to laugh. We love to joke. We pick on each other. Um, I'll text the kids in the morning and be like, good morning, dorks. Like, it's not like a... So I'm taking this picture, not because I want to document it for a sales meeting, but because I want to send it to the kids and be like, look at dad. <laughs> he's out there, he's taking pictures of his plants because he took pictures every single day. So I send this, this is him and he's out there and he's taking a picture so that he can document, he can look, he can send it to his cousin. This stuff here, fish fertilizer, this is the worst smelling stuff that you will ever smell. It is awful. Just like there are things in our business that are awful. Yeah, it's terrible. It's the worst. And so his cousin ordered it for him and had it shipped to our house and said, dude, you have to put this on your plants. It's going to take off. And so Eric's like, okay, well, it's a cap full into a gallon of water. And he mixes it up in my kitchen the first time. And I'm like, what is that smell? No more. No more. And he's like, you're right. So he does that outside. So now I'm taking away water from the sink. He's got to do it by the hose. I mean, he's got everything against him with these peppers. Every Sunday night, he would go out with his stuff and he would put it on his pepper plants. Every Sunday night, I did not put it on my tomato plants. I did not nurture and love my tomato plants, but he did. He also put it on my hydrangeas and they flourished. I mean, this, it is amazing. So if you're really struggling with plants, get this stuff. Don't fill it in your house. The, <laughs> it's, your dog will love it. it oh, they will love it. They were always trying to get into the dirt. And I was oh, like, what? Because they love it. It's, it's horrible. He would do it on Sunday night after we went in from the pool. And then no one was going to be out there till at least Monday afternoon. So it had time to, yes, I forgot about that. Oh, yeah. That's why he started doing it on Sunday night so that the dogs wouldn't go into it. So when you are giving support and you are fish fertilizing your relationships, you are regularly checking in with them. You are sending them market updates. You are doing a pop by to them. You are reaching out and calling them. You are sending them videos. It is giving them everything that they need to know that I can count on you. I can trust on you. You're going to help my bit. You're, you're going to help my transaction grow. I know that I've got you. So then becoming the uh, blossoming signs of trust and commitment. This is them driving down the road and they see a sign and they call you, even though your name is not the name on the sign because you've loved on them. You've nurtured them. So they think of you when they think of real estate, just like when you're doing here with your plans, you have to make sure that you are out there. Again, that fish fertilizer, you have, it, it's relying on you. If it, we have a drought, he waters it every single night by a certain amount with the watering can. And God forbid, because I did do this, I would sometimes be like, okay, I guess I'll help him with these pepper plants. So then I would water him. He's like, I already watered them. I'm like, oh gosh, here I am finally trying to help and support you because they're taking off and they're thriving. But this is such a critical piece. This is such a critical part when that flower comes. I saw the flower first and I was like, oh my gosh, there's a flower. So I'm now getting excited for him seeing the fruits of his labor come because he puts so much time and effort into this. So now he starts getting his peppers. Okay. So you're finally, you're there. You're getting your peppers. It's showing that it's coming. I thought there was something wrong with them. I'm like, they're shriveled up. Something's not right. And he's like, no, that's what they're supposed to look like. There are three different types of peppers. One is the hottest in the world. And then the other two, I mean, they are, they are, they are horrible. 
that he he ate some of the things and it, one is one is um scotch bonnet one's a reaper something i mean one it's hard they're terrible his eyes and he loves his eyes would water up when he didn't even kind of cough a little bit but he loves it so here this is your settlement you know, you've, you're finally, you've done it. You've gotten them to the settlement table. You are settling. The peppers are here. You're done, right? Okay. No, you're not done. And this is where Eric took it from here to here. You could say, great, I've got this. And by the way, we have so many peppers. So many. I think we're on round, I know we're on round three or four of new ones coming in on the plants. But each time, after he gets the peppers, what he then does is sustaining long-term success. He takes them, he cuts them in half, he puts them in a dehydrator. Because why stop with the pepper? There's no way that any human could eat the amount of peppers that we have. And we don't know people that like this type of pepper enough to give them out. So he's got to do something with them. Just like when you get to settlement, if you just say, hey, congratulations, I'm so happy. They loved you. You did a great job. They give you a great review. You know, Amy was the best. Letha was the best. They were the absolute best. However, that's it. You don't follow up with them. They don't hear from you again. That's it. Great, great product. You know, great pepper. It was awesome. But then what? Well, you got to take it a step further. And you got to be <laughs> loving on them. And that's where you do the Popeyes and the phone calls and the one year anniversary and the equity review and the, you know, all of this stuff. And that's what Eric's doing here. So he pulled seeds out so that he could plant seeds for next year. He's actually going to try and cross pollinate and create even a hotter pepper. Uh, yeah. As if that's even possible. So he dries them out and then he comes to this. So he's still sustaining the long-term success. He's still, he's, he's taking it a step further. He gets out a coffee grinder and he grinds them up and he creates all of these little powders because the powders won't go bad. He also has bags of them in the freezer and he just keeps putting them in. And I don't know what he's going to do with them because <laughs> till he can get through them, we'll be at next year and he'll have more growing. But in this case here for you guys, it's again, loving on your clients, taking it the next step, following through. So, you know, for every challenge that Eric had on those peppers, me being probably the biggest one, giving him a small pot in the worst possible place in the yard to grow the peppers, he made the best out of it because of how he loved on it, how he took care of it, and how he checked on it regularly. He was out there the other day, I walked past and we're, we're away next week. And I said, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? You got all these new, all these new peppers coming. And he was like, well, I'll have the dog sitter check them or I'll have this or, but he's still, he didn't just stop because he has a elf in the house and he has, I don't know how many, but a lot of these little jars. He could have said, okay, I'm done if the rest of them die. But no, he's still out there checking on them, watering them, doing everything that he needs to do. In our business, that's what we need to do. We can't say, okay, you know what? I've got 10 deals going or I closed 10 deals, so I'm good. And you just stop and I'll pick back up with it next year. And I'll start loving on it again next year. No, it's that constant keeping those plates spinning in the air of loving on your people, moving forward, um, loving, using the burr months to go out and recognize them. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm grateful for you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Taking advantage of that so that you continue to grow and you continue to help nurture that plant, which is your business. He, I am so proud of him. And I told him, I said, Eric, this is amazing. What you have done is absolutely amazing. You took the worst, the worst area and here you grow. So we're going to leave you with this. Don't wish it were easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for fewer problems. Wish for more skills. Don't wish for less change. Wish.